So good morning, everybody, and welcome to Estate Strategies for a Post-COVID World. This is the latest in the LCMB Building Performance webinar series. I'm John O'Brien. I'm the founder and MD of LCMB, and our mission as a business is to transform the impact that our clients, workplaces, buildings, and estates have on the life of their uh, organizations, people, and customers. So as a business, since the beginning of this year, like many, we've been grappling with um, and responding to COVID. In addition, we've been working with a diverse cross-section of clients to um, map out their response to COVID. Our office shut down two weeks in advance of the UK shut down. And at the beginning of the year, through February, March, April and May, we were working with our NHS clients to program manage the first COVID um, wave. Um, and there's quite a bit of learning from, from, from this and subsequent work. Our initial work include reconfiguring estates, creating hot and cold patient pathways for those with and without COVID, it, putting in place additional ICU capacity, infrastructure and staff welfare for NHS clients. More recently, we've been working with NHS and other clients to um, ensure that the workplaces are COVID secure. And we've been working with higher education clients to ensure that their estates, um, learning facilities and accommodation were COVID secure for the safe return of students. So today, over the next 15 and 20 minutes, I'm gonna set out our thoughts on how to create a workplace, estate and real estate strategy to re respond to COVID. Here and now, as we have the uncertainties um, of the government and uh, clinical response to um, the disease, and over the next one to two years, as we transition from the current COVID world to a post-COVID world. So we've been working our living with COVID since January when the first two cases were confirmed in the UK. And after the first death in March, the country went into lockdown on the 26th of March. Since June and July of this year, restrictions have been gradually relaxed. And we're now entering a period of uncertainty, as we can see, where um, national governments um, and regional governments are having to do national lockdowns or pan-country lockdowns and regional lockdowns. In our view, we will have to live with the COVID restrictions until a vaccine emerge. And the current consensus by those that know is that we're unlikely to have a vaccine until the middle of next year. Once it emerges, it's likely to be targeted the vulnerable and frontline NHS staff in the UK, with the rest of us not seeing it until circa 2021, oh, sorry, 2022, either Q1 or Q2. So on this basis, we can expect to have to manage uh, with COVID restrictions and limitations until the end of next year at least, and be flexible enough, certainly through the uh, fourth quarter, the winter period in the UK, and through the first quarter of next year, and possibly the second quarter, to continue to have to respond to local and national lockdowns. So how should we respond with respect to our real estate, our workplaces and buildings? Firstly, we need to manage a safe return to work. Secondly, we need to make these workplaces COVID secure and keep them secure for our people, our customers and our organisations. Thirdly, we recommend creating some space and dwell time to think through the lessons learned. Then apply these lessons learned to creating a new workplace and remote working model that will take you through and beyond the COVID secure phase to the new post COVID world when it emerges in 2022 or later. This will help you update your workplace and property as soon as possible. And I'll cover each step in a little bit more detail in the coming slides. My colleague, Rudy Duplessy, our Director of Operations, covered the topic of managing a safe return to our workplace in our previous webinar. There's guidance documents and a copy of this webinar to download from our website if you, if you need further detail in this regard. But in summary, you need to carry out a risk assessment for each member of your team to identify above average um, vulnerabilities. Offer remote working where possible and support your people to travel to and from um, the office safely and provide a COVID secure workplace. 
So a COVID secure workplace is defined as a workplace that complies with the health and safety, government and third party best practice and advice. The government's guidance lists five steps organisations need to take to become COVID secure. The first is to complete a risk assessment, which is shared with staff and unions. The second is to ensure that cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures and facilities are in place for your staff and, and any visitors, customers um, or people entering the workplace for, for meetings. The third step is to ensure that you've taken reasonable steps to um, ensure you have a COVID secure workplace. This would include ensuring that those with symptoms stay awake from the workplace. You have infection protocols in place to ensure that if you do get an outbreak, it's dealt with effectively, and that you've paid attention to your building systems, particularly ventilation to mitigate, mitigate the potential for cross transmission risk. This means ensuring that ventilation systems are in 100% fresh air, there's no recirculation. You switch off heat recovery systems, all toilet systems are turned to operate 24 seven and you've got a protocol in place to ensure that there's no aerosol of waste and that you purge workplaces before and after um, uh, occupancy periods. The fourth point is to ensure that you take all reasonable steps to keep people two meters apart. This would include thinking through circulation strategies for your uh, your building, arrival at, um, at reception, getting into lifts, vertical transportation through the, uh, the building and moving to desks and, and out and um, how you facilitate uh, meetings and teamwork. And then fifthly, where people cannot be two meters apart, ensure they're one meter apart and you've taken steps to mitigate transmission risk. This would include barriers, PPE as appropriate. The next step is to stop, think and gather more insight into what COVID-19 is exposed about your people and organization. This will enable you to think about how you can potentially reconfigure um, what you do to create a better version of yourselves for the future. The first area to explore and think about is what the pandemic has exposed about your processes and performance. So did your business continuity and disaster recovery plan survive contact with COVID? Did your team's performance improve or decrease working remotely? Interestingly, this point seems to have split opinion. Um, if you take the view of Netflix and their founder, Reed Hastings, he has gone on record as saying home working is a pure negative. Certainly we're finding in creative businesses where people need to work together to create their output through remote working, their productivity is reduced. But we are aware of a number of businesses where working remotely, where their nature of the work is of more individual uh, performance, they've managed to see an improvement in performance. So I don't think there's one solution for um, every organization, it'll be down to the context of what you do and how your people work together to deliver the, their results. Secondly, behavior. What has employee behavior during the pandemic shown you about your existing workplace setup and infrastructure? And what do you need to do differently as a consequence? And finally, your needs. We'd recommend surveying or speaking in detail to your staff and customers to understand what they think you should be doing in your workplaces and remotely. The questions to consider are how do you continue to build social capital when you've got a mixed model of remote working and workplace? How does creative work get done? And what cannot, what can you not do remotely and what must you be doing in the workplace? And finally, what infrastructure is required to support the blended way of working between the workplace and um, the workplace and remotely. Once you understand these lessons learned and the needs, you can start to think about how to create a new property model. We'd recommend start by working and defining what work should be done remotely and what should be done in the workplace. This will help you create a picture of what percentage of employees will be remote working in turn, which will give you an immediate first pass on the um, property space or workspace that you'll require. So if you allow seven to 10 square meters per person times the number of people times the percentage that they'll now be in the office, 
you'll immediately get um, a view of the new gross internal floor area that you need, need across your, your, um, your, your estate or your property portfolio at a national or local level. So this will start to give you an initial view and you can drill in for local variations based on the work that's done uh, locally in, in your workplaces or individual uh, buildings or different estates across the uh, UK. Once you've done this, you can start to work out how you shrink and divest your, your estate to suit. The important thing to remember um, is that for long-term success, your, report, your re remote working model should offer an employee experience equal to or equivalent to the workplace. And we need to remember that employee experience, health, well-being and performance is a function of the quality of the indoor working environment. Over the last few years, we've researched the impact of indoor environmental quality and worker performance with a, um, a group of world-class organisations, including Argent Kings, National Air Traffic Control, Innovate UK and Oxford Brookes University. And what we've discovered is that in line with research from World Green Building Council, Harvard University and others, the working environment matters, particularly light, CO2, temperature, but also noise, relative humidity, PM 2.5 and VOCs for volatile organic compounds. So, for example, in our study, we found that when workers were exposed to um, ventilation rates, which reduced the parts per million of CO2 below 1400, that their um, capability in, in, in completing admin and um, numerical tasks increased by 62% and they were completed 12% more accurately. World Green Building Council and Harvard University reports similar impact on cognitive uh, performance as well as uh, routine numerical and processing skills. Harvard University uh, simulated a high level um, strategic response to a disaster recovery um, exercise in different indoor environments and found that the uh, creative insight and quality of results were directly impacted by the, um, by the working environment. And conservatively, British Council for Offices have um, calculated that well-managed workplaces deliver between two and a half and three and a half percent productivity improvement. And this is, whilst it sounds low, this is sufficient to cover 100% of property costs outside of London and 75% of property costs inside London. And for most organisations, is equivalent to 50% of the bottom line. So knowing the quality of our physical environments impacts the health, well-being and performance of our people, it's important to think about how we address this for a re re remote working model as well as a workplace model to protect our people and organizations. There's a significant view that post pandemic, there's likely to be um, a lot of litigation in this space where people um, are directly holding their organizations and employers to account for the impact of COVID on their health and well-being, either through workplace or remote working models. So I think it's important to think about the, um, the, the, the quality and impact of re remote working for, for two reasons. Uh, one is it matters, so the health, well-being, performance and productivity of your staff will be directly impacted by the quality of their remote or home working uh, environment. And, and secondly, um, there's an obligation, uh, currently moral and likely to emerge as legal for, for us to do so. This can be done quite simply um, by thinking through remote working policies, having simple risk assessments in place and the uh, use of inexpensive technology such as wireless sensing or um, indoor environmental sensing, which costs between 100 to three, 400 pounds a, a, a piece for high quality data. So to configure your workplaces and property for a post COVID world, we, rec uh, we recommend action now to firstly, seek your employees feedback, read the value of the workplace and what they think should be done in the workplace and what should be done remotely. Secondly, shrink workplaces and estates to free up investment for um, a better quality remote working model. Thirdly, have a remote working model and plan that's every bit as good and well thought through as the investment that you make in your workplace and um, property strategy. Fourthly, 
ensure you get a stay um, ensure you get and stay COVID secure and have a flexible approach that can deal with local and national lockdowns to end um, to the end of 2021. And finally, think about how you can maximize your employee experience, their health, well-being, performance and productivity, irrespective of whether they're working in the workplace or remotely. So just to um, um, summarize and um, close with some closing thoughts. So to date, COVID-19 has demonstrated that some estates can shrink by 60% plus. A couple of weeks ago, Caput in the UK came out and went public with the fact that they're closing two thirds of the UK offices. Research shows that workplace optimization will deliver significant uh, additional output and monetary value equivalent to your property costs. As I said, our research and research by others such as Harvard, um, World Green Building Council, British Council for Offices shows that workplaces either remote or fixed, which are configured for um, indoor environmental quality can produce an additional two to three and a half percent of output equivalent to 100% of property costs outside of London, 75% inside and 50% of most organizations bottom line. So if you haven't done so already, the steps to take are to risk assess, get COVID secure, stay COVID secure and be flexible so that you can respond to the government um, guidelines, which in turn are responding to the uncertain development of the pandemic as we go into winter and implement a new way of working now. So I'm going to um, move on to questions. You can download our researcher guidance and tips from our website, www.lcmb.co.uk. Please feel free to contact me afterwards for any supplementary questions or guidance at john at lcmb.co.uk or my mobile number or, or office number, which are on the website and um, in the, um, uh, the presentation from today. Please feel free to get in touch if you have any questions after today and do sign up for our newsletter. We are regularly producing on a monthly basis guidance around COVID and other topics. So what I'll do is I'll turn my camera on and I'll come back, um, I'll stop sharing the slides so that I can see if anybody's raising their hands or has a question to ask. And this is an opportunity for me to pick up any questions that were uh, positioned <coughs> in the uh, presentation. So I'm just going to move to questions. So are there any immediate um, questions? Um, so if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask me a question directly. Hi, John. Uh, my name's Andrew. I'd like to just uh, say something. It's, thank you for your presentation. Thank One you, of the things I've, I think organisations also need to take account of isn't just their corporate real estate, real estate strategy, but also their wider business. Um, uh, I don't know what... Uh, you know, it depends what type of business, but the, but the pandemic might absolutely drastically change the future of your actual business, whatever it is, retail or, or whatever. And so it's not just working out where, um, uh, what your office strategy might be and how many, what percentage of people can return to the workplace and what kind of uh, aspects of the workplace need to be mothballed, but actually you might have to change your whole business. And so actually your planning needs to be um, even longer into the future, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's an ex uh, excellent point, Andrew. I mean, if you just take two examples of clients that we've been working with recently, the NHS and higher education. Higher education, um, an immediate response was to go to remote learning and um, using remote learning platforms to deliver uh, teaching, particularly in the in the, um, the stages of the last academic year. And I think that's already disrupting their business model and getting them thinking about how they deliver their student experience and, and their model going forward. And I think they've probably understood that um, there's an opportunity to do something around shrinking the estate and reinvesting that model in their in their teaching and the quality of the student experience. Equally, the NHS has had a similar experience because just to get back to the um, experience we had at, at the beginning when we were trying to free up um, 
clinical space for um, the first wave of patients. The immediate response was to stop people coming to, to the hospital for um, face to face consultations. And they, they as uh, they probably um, moved forward by five or 10 years in terms of their adoption of um, remote um, uh, uh, sessions where they were using technology to have um, virtual um, patient um, discussion. So I think you're absolutely right. I think in addition to what um, the change in the people that you accommodate in your offices and workplaces and remotely, it's to stop and think how have your customers responded differently and is there an opportunity to actually do things differently, deliver things differently. I think it's a really good point. Thank you, Andrew. I'm just trying to see um, on my screen whether anybody else has a their hand up or a question. So I just I can see that there was a question that came in um, around third party advice um, and how you actually configure buildings from a technical point of view. So just to just to pick this up, the um, the health and safety advice and the government advice is giving general advice around um, social distancing, uh, health and safety obligations in the space. In, ter in terms of technical advice and third party advice, um, what we found is that you need to go to um, uh, you need to go to third party experts. So if we take ventilation as an example, in the uh, in the UK. The Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers are the go-to organization for mechanical electrical systems. And they have advice, COVID advice on their um, on their website, as does the um, RIBA, the um, Institute of British Architects, and the RICS. Um, so most of the professional organizations have COVID guidance on their websites. But it's important to be aware that this is um, moving at a reasonably fast pace and is changing um, uh, um, in response to government guidelines and the um, uh, and the changing nature of the. So I think uh, just jumping back to our previous point, um, getting COVID secure is about taking the best current advice and configuring your workplaces and the states to suit. And then staying COVID um, um, secure is very much about um, is very much about ensuring that you respond to events in your workplace and that you keep an eye on guidance and um, and updating because it is changing and typically changing every sort of one one to two months. Okay, I'm just going to see. Do we have any further questions? Um, is there anything anybody else would like to ask us? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in my colleague Rudy Duplessis um, and just ask Rudy uh, if um, if he has any observations based on um, the work that we've been doing with our clients or anything that he would like to uh, elaborate in terms of the points I've made. So Rudy, is there is there anything that you would sort of um, pick up from the work with our NHS clients or workplace clients or higher education that you think stands out. Uh, morning, John. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, I think yeah, I think you've covered most of it. The, the key thing for me is the point about risk assessment, and, and Andrew made it very eloquently. The the risk assessment needs to cover not just what you're doing today. It also needs to cover what you're doing tomorrow, and, and that includes everything to do with the built environment, but it also includes everything to do with your people. And whether the, whether your people are working from the premises that you own, or whether they're working from uh, their own home or from somewhere else, they still remain your people, and that's that's an important point to remember. Uh, and and that's something that most good organisations have in common, is that they th they think of their people first. Uh, you, you also made the point about the strategy. Uh, I made the point in my own webinar earlier. And, and it's it's borne out by research as well, is that an investment in the people and their well-being will pay dividends much more than a, an investment purely in bricks and mortar. So that, that's just a, a little highlight to consider as you go. 
Okay, thank you for that, Rudy. But uh, I, I think just building back on the point that Andrew made, um, I think it's important to think through both um, your own people's response to the pandemic and what you need to do differently based on their behaviour and needs, but equally to, to, to stand back and think about the um, the response in terms of behaviour and needs of your customers and how you blend those two things together going forward. Um, I guess the, the overarching point I'm making or trying to make through the, um, the webinar is that we are now in a period of uncertainty, but which is likely to, to last through to the end of next year, in our view, um, unless Oxford come good with a, um, a vaccine before the end of this year. But if we take the best, um, the expert advice that's out there, we're likely to have to deal with COVID secure and COVID uncertainty through to the end of next year. So in our view, this is the best time to start um, considering these issues and reconfiguring your plans and estate to suit and start moving to actually put that in place so that you can deal with the uncertainty. Um, local lockdowns, national lockdowns are a gradual reduction in restrictions as we move into next year and that you're fast to shrink your estate or reconfigure your estate so that you can make the investment in a, um, a better remote working model that delivers your employee experience and your customer experience. So at that point, I'm just going to stop and see if there's any final questions before I summarize and close out. So I can't immediately see any hands up unless I'm missing. No. OK, so I'm going to thank you for your time um, time in joining us today. The slides will be um, sent out to you after today's um, webinar. Please feel free to, to come back to me um, and ask any questions. There's guidance and reports on our website if you'd like to um, download them um, in terms of making a safe return to the, um, the workplace. Uh, if you'd like some additional uh, risk assessment um, uh, toolkits, do come back to either Rudy or myself and we'll make those available. And if you're interested in our ongoing advice, please do sign up to our newsletters. And finally, before I finish, a date for your diary. On the 11th of um, November, sorry, on the 19th of November at 11 a.m., so 11 a.m. Thursday, the 19th of November, we'll have our next um, webinar. And next webinar will be in conversation with a cross-section of our customers about their response and lessons learned from the pandemic. So we'll be covering um, the workplace, higher education and NHS sectors and talking to our clients about their initial ongoing response to COVID and their thoughts about how ultimately it's going to impact their workplace building and estate strategy. So I'm going to leave it there and thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you for your time and bye-bye.